Global terrorism did not start on 9-11. For decades before that, Britain and America have been colluding with radical Islamist groups, even terrorist groups, to promote very basic foreign policy objectives. Incredibly, what happened after 9-11 was not that Britain and America stopped conniving with Islamist groups. If anything, they stepped up their support for those radical Islamist groups. The official story is Britain and the US have been engaged in a war against terrorism and a war against Islamic extremism. But the reality is that Britain and the US actively funded groups and organizations who were allied to the same people who conducted 9-11. Look at the war in Libya, look at the war in Syria. It's important to understand that the phenomenon of Osama bin Laden goes back to British policy as well as US policy in the 1980s in Afghanistan when Britain along with the US, covertly supported the Mujahideen warriors in Afghanistan to overturn the Soviet occupation of the country. Inside the bright tented enclosure, 1,500 men waited. Many of these men were Mujahideen who traveled from the border specially for this meeting. A mullah chanted some verses from the Quran. Mrs. Thatcher promised them an extra two million pounds worth of aid, and she made clear the West's support for the Afghan resistance fighters. I want to say that the hearts of the free world are with you. Britain and the US lack strong allies on the ground, so they collaborate with whoever is available in order to achieve their objectives. We've just held a very useful, also I will add a very moving discussion with Chairman Yunus Khalis of the Islamic Union of Mujahideen of Afghanistan and other members of his distinguished delegation. I expressed our nation's continued strong support for the resistance. If you want to overthrow the Soviet-backed government in Afghanistan, who's available? Mujahideen holy warriors. U.S. National Security Advisor Brzezinski flew to Pakistan to set about rallying resistance. He wanted to arm the Mujahideen without revealing America's role. On the Afghan border near the Khyber Pass, he urged the soldiers of God to redouble their efforts. We know of their deep belief in God, and we are confident that their struggle will succeed. That land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. What's happened over the last few decades is that both Britain and the US have been collaborating with two types of radical Islamist groups. First of all, there are the state sponsors of those organizations. The Saudis have poured millions, billions of dollars of funding into the radical Islamic cause over the decades. And they've done that, they've promoted that extremism while having a special relationship with Britain. It emerged today that Britain and Saudi Arabia have signed what's thought to be one of the world's biggest arms agreements. And a special relationship with the US. Then there's the private groups promoting the, the radical Islamic cause. Groups like al-Nusra in Syria, the Mujahideen going back to 1980s in Afghanistan. One very unknown episode in British history is in the Kosovo War in 1999. Britain secretly trained forces in Kosovo allied to al-Qaeda. Britain had secret training camps in Kosovo and Albania where it trained forces at the same camp as al-Qaeda were training. One of the KLA units was run by the brother of Ayman al-Zawahiri, then bin Laden's right-hand man, and now the head of al-Qaeda. What I found doing research about the 1990s in the UK, London was seen as a safe place for Islamic radicals to base themselves. And this was done with the complicity of the British government. And there seemed to be a compact uh, an understanding that was taking place between Whitehall and those Islamic militants. If those is Islamic militants agreed not to carry out terrorist attacks in the UK, the British authorities would tolerate them. And that was known as the Covenant of Security, a kind of a secret understanding between the British authorities and these radical Islamist groups. And that had the policy of nurturing terrorism as well, because what it meant was radical groups who wanted to conduct operations, sometimes straight terrorist operations around the Middle East, had a safe base. In fact, Osama bin Laden had a base in London. Not him personally, but people around him. This was a communications base, it was a back office, it was a support network for the bin Laden organization. It's undoubtedly the case that the West policy of nurturing Islamic extremist groups has contributed to the terrorism 
that we now face. Salman Abidi, the Manchester bomber who killed 22 people in 2017 at a pop concert in Manchester. He fought in David Cameron's war in Libya in 2011. My view is that there's never actually been a war against terrorism. What there's been is a war against targets designated as terrorists by London and Washington. Outside of their calculations are a load of other Islamist groups who they themselves have actually been nurturing and supporting over the years. In the 1950s and in the 1960s, there was a Cold War in the region, a war between secular nationalist governments on the one hand, and on the other hand, Islamist organizations who were backed by the Saudis and the other Gulf states. And what Britain did in that Cold War was not to support the more secular, nationalist, more popular regimes. It was to ally themselves with the Islamic right in order to overthrow those more popular governments. Britain was so desperate to get rid of Nasser, the president of Egypt, who was then the champion of the anti-Western nationalist cause in the Middle East. Not only did Britain invade secretly with Israel and France in 1956, but they also colluded with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt at that time, who were then an out-and-out -out terrorist organization. The details are murky, but there is evidence to suggest that Britain worked with the Muslim Brotherhood to try and overthrow or even assassinate Nasser. At a similar time, 1953, in Iran, MI6, with the CIA, overthrew the government of Mossadegh to get their hands on Iran's oil resources. Less known is the fact that in fomenting the uprising against Mossadegh, Britain and the US secretly collaborated with the leading Islamist force in the country, Ayatollah Kashani, forerunner of Ayatollah Khomeini. Again, Britain was reaching out to anyone that was available to foment demonstrations, to organize an opposition against a nationalist government that it wanted to see overthrown. It doesn't matter to them who they're funding, who they're working with, because Whitehall and Washington have no moral consistency. They actually have no morals in their foreign policy, so they'll turn to whoever in order to achieve their particular short-term objectives. That, in most cases, has been to uh, overthrow governments and to ensure that their oil interests are protected in certain key regions of the world, mainly the Middle East. If you look at what happened in Iraq, what's happened in Syria, it's an absolute calamity. And that has come about through considered decisions taken by political leaders in Washington and London who have chosen to fund certain groups, chosen to do certain things which had real world consequences for millions of people. Not only have they helped to destroy these countries, they've completely escaped all accountability for it. No one is holding George Bush to account. No one is holding Tony Blair to account. No one is holding David Cameron to account or any of the other political leaders who have been responsible for these policies of nurturing radical Islam over the decades. In my view, Islamism, both the ideology and the violence, is a first order security threat and unchecked, it will come to us, even if centered far from us, as 9-11 demonstrated. It's frankly incredible that Tony Blair has the gall to say in public that Islamism is now a first order security threat to the West when his policies directly contributed to the rise of the global terrorism threat that we now face. His decisions in Iraq, along with George Bush, directly contributed to Al-Qaeda in Iraq, then Islamic State in Iraq, then Islamic State spread to other countries in the region and then numerous other countries around the world. Tony Blair's policies, and actually alongside the political class, in the US and the UK as well, who supported him. They bear responsibility for the rise of global terrorism to a degree that, that we see now. There's no doubt that British and American policy have set back the cause of democracy and human rights in the Middle East over the decades, because London and Washington have often chosen to ally with authoritarian regimes that are repressing their people, or they've chosen to ally with extremist Islamist groups to promote their own policies and the people that have lost out in both cases have been the ordinary people of the Middle East who have borne the brunt of those Anglo-American policies. When you look at the declassified files, when you go through what policymakers are interested in promoting in the Middle East, what's clear is that they don't care about the people of the region. There are no files that I've seen, literally, that stress the importance of the interests of the people of the region. What's stressed in those secret planning files is oil, is military bases, it's the ability to intervene in those countries and the ability to ensure that their governments abide by Western interests and promote our concerns, not the concerns of their people. I have a concern at the moment that Britain is actually beginning what seems to be a new alliance with the Taliban. 
This is an organisation that's been fighting British troops for 20 years in Afghanistan. It's been reported that MI6 have been talking to the Taliban to actually set up a covert military base in the country. It's clear that the West does need a radically different foreign policy to really address the causes of terrorism. But the first thing that needs to happen is what any doctor would say is do no harm. Stop supporting those groups in the first place. Stop supporting the states who have been primarily supporting radical Islamic groups, terrorist groups for years. Why are we in a strategic alliance with them? That needs to change first. And then we need to stop these covert and overt military interventions, actions by our security forces who are actually unaccountable. We need to stop those interventions in support of those extremist groups. And we need to democratize our foreign policy so that the public can genuinely see what our governments are doing. That's not happening at the moment. We have a very centralized, opaque foreign policy decision-making system and process. Policymakers really aren't accountable for their actions. They get away with murder, literally. When you look at our interventions in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya, in Afghanistan, I think most people have come to understand that they've been disastrous, been disastrous for the people of those countries and been disastrous for us as well. I don't see that there's public support for these military interventions around the world. The public doesn't want the British military to be able to maraud around the world doing what it likes, knowing that the impacts are more terrorism, more war, more conflict, more instability around the world. Elites need to be held in check and they need to be democratised. And the public is way ahead of the political class and the political class needs to start listening more to the public in their opposition to these military interventions overseas. The establishment media is completely not telling us the truth about the UK's role in the world. To hear that, you need to go to independent media and it's very important for people to fund and support independent media. So please go to Double Down News, support them on Patreon, support Declassified UK on Enthuse.